Hey, thanks so much for clicking on this video and welcome to the haves and the have nots review here on YouTube. If you're a fan of Tyler Perry, you've come to the right place. Be sure to click that subscribe button as well as the bell notification icon. That way you don't miss out on any new content on the channel. And also check me out on these social media platforms and links in the description below will lead you to my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook group, and Facebook page. Once again, thanks for joining in and enjoy the video. All right, have and have not fans, what an episode exhausted. Now, first off, I want to thank everyone for being very understanding about last night. I uh, let everybody know on social media that Xfinity kind of blinked out on me a couple of times throughout the episode. So I missed like the first 45 seconds and then about two minutes of the conversation that Candace had with Charles and just a couple of brief scenes in between the entire episode. But overall, I went back, rewatched it. We rewatched the episode this morning. I, I did a live stream with Chandler last night on Instagram, and I'm actually glad I waited instead of just rushing the episode review because there were a lot of things that I really didn't think about until the second viewing, as well as talking about it with Chandler out loud. So, um, I it was a good episode. Way better than last week's episode of the committee. I don't feel that it was as good as the episode chosen. I, uh, that episode was a couple weeks ago. I gave it a 10 out of 10. Honestly, I feel like this episode is probably about an 8.5 out of 10. And once again, that is not a bad score at all. I mean, a lot of people said 10 out of 10. When I first watched it, watched it I was thinking 10 out of 10. But once I talked through some things out loud and thought about some things, it really wasn't 10 territory in my opinion. Now, some people, let, let's just talk about real quick some characters who weren't even there. RK, Gia, and Justin. Now, Justin not being there alone was enough for some people to automatically give it like a 15 out of 10. And I can see why, but... Let me just say, it was an episode that kept me on the edge of my seat for most of it. I'm not, I'm not lying. Like when I was looking at, it, I'm like, well, damn, because we're jumping from scene to scene. We're, we're getting some plot twist, and we're getting things that you know good and well. I've been complaining about, talking about, and bringing up in conversation all year long. You know, certain plot points, certain character interactions. So that stuff was very, very well done. I do feel like this episode, after going back and rewatching it. I feel like this episode would have really benefited from a 90 minute finale. So, you know, if you subtract commercials, we're looking at possibly an episode around maybe 72 minutes or so, give or take commercials. I mean, a 60 minute episode is 42, you know, if you take away commercials. So that's about, you know, 18. So I guess you could say if you plug on another 30 minutes and then you subtract nine minutes of commercials, um, that's what? 18 plus 9 equals 27, so 90 minus 27 equals, oh crap, I don't want to mess this up. Um, I want to say 63, yeah, 63 minutes, so it would have been a little over an hour. I, I feel like some scenes definitely needed that. Okay, so let's just break it down here. Jeffrey, we pick up where we left off. Basically, Jeffrey and Madison kissing. Veronica walks in on them. What I loved about this scene is, you know, Veronica, you know, going off and ex insulting Jeffrey and Madison. That was pretty effed up. I really don't want to get into the details. You all saw it. It's pretty much, you know, her just being the homophobe she is. And, you know, just another quick thank you. That video I did recently about are there too many, um, you know, gay characters on the show. I think I used the abbreviation instead of gay due to demonetization but looking through the comments i i mean i haven't went back in the past 12 hours but for the most part you all conducted yourselves exactly like i requested a very civil collection of comments i don't think i saw anybody going at it with each other you pretty much stated your opinions everybody was respectful that is what this channel is all about so basically you know veronica she goes in on him and Jeffrey pretty much, you know, pulls out the book. I love how we didn't have to wait either. I thought we would have to wait like six or seven episodes to find out what was in the book. Apparently it has, you know, Veronica and Candace's names, phone number, contact information. Jeffrey puts two and two together that this whole Erica thing was nothing but a scheme concocted by Candace 
Veronica and Erica in order to extort from David or at least, you know, sabotage him somehow. So the fact he wants to take that intel to the police is pretty darn interesting. And Veronica, not even flinching, pretty much he doesn't think Jeffrey's going to do anything. And I mean, to be honest, she said the cops are after her. So this will probably screw her over in one, more than, you know, more ways than one. So I don't really know what she's talking about. But I mean, what did she say? It's like, well, damn, you can't even get not that I want you to be doing this shit anyway. You couldn't be with a black man. So, I mean, you know, she literally just insults them some more. And then what did she say? It's like, um, it's fitting that you two are in a closet. That was pretty cold, but funny. And then, you know, in order for Jeffrey to get rid of Veronica, she he starts going in on Madison, who doesn't want any part of this. And let me just say this right now. I don't think the Jeffrey and Madison thing is going to go anywhere. And you're like, Jeremy, how dare you say that? Madison is like the best thing we've seen happen to Jeffrey lately. Here's what I mean. If you go back to season two and three, when Landon had shown up, and was really helping Jeffrey find his way. And you, and it was kind of thought that those two would be together. Jeffrey really only used Landon as a way to get back at Veronica. If you go back and look at those seasons, you will see that Jeffrey pretty much used Landon as a scapegoat whenever he wanted to scare off Veronica. Hell, even that episode is like, um, what was the episode title? Was it called Enough? Basically the episode where, um, you know, Veronica Bell, Benny out of jail, they had sex in David's truck, and then she burned down the house. Earlier in the episode, Jeffrey went over there and literally went off on Veronica, and she was like, what the hell are we going to name this baby? And basically, after going off on her about, you know, the fact that he's gay, just get over it, he went back to the hotel and had sex with Landon, and we know that was just a way for him to rebel against his mom. The fact that he was using Madison as a method of getting under Veronica's skin I feel it's sort of a clear indication that, yeah, this is not starting on solid foundation. Not to mention, Madison got a small glimpse into the crazy-ass family that Jeffrey has. So, I, I don't know how long Madison's going to be around. I'm just saying, I don't think he's going to be killed off. He was in Atlanta for filming for Season 7, so he's going to be a while, he's going to be around for a while, but to what capacity, I don't know. And then we get to the point where those two are scuffling with each other madison's telling them to stop and as i predicted months ago she went over the balcony and hit the boxes and somebody was like jeremy doesn't it look like veronica smiling up at jeffrey y'all wrong for that that was pretty damn funny so i mean based off the preview for the next episode speak through it she's still lying on the floor and madison and jeffrey are still looking at her so how long how long was they how these events occurring at the same time makes no sense to me but you're probably wondering jeremy why aren't you talking about the most exciting part about the episode? Well, at least that scene somewhat. David not being Jeffrey's real father. Well, not much to say about it because number one, we don't know if Veronica's lying or not. Number two, I made videos on this way back in June. I made a video on this yesterday about David is not Jeffrey's real father. So really not much to say on that. I wonder exactly what's going to be brought up on that in the future. Will it be something that's swept under the rug? Honestly, I don't think it's something that should be brought up very quickly with so much going on. I mean, literally, it would kind of suck because the big question here is, does David know? I feel like that's the most important question. Not so much who is Jeffrey's real father, but who does David know? Does he know that he's not Jeffrey's father? Does he not? I mean, does he know that he's not um, or does or he doesn't know? So we'll have to just we'll have to wait and see. It'll be pretty damn interesting to say the least. OK, um, basically, now we're going over to Sarah being caught on the hidden cameras. All I got to say is I remember bringing this up a while ago that even though she easily went into the evidence room, I'm like, shouldn't there be a camera or something showing people who go showing who goes in and out of the room? And the fact that they had the hidden cameras in there, those were some crisp HD cameras. The quality on those were amazing. So they look at her and next thing you know, um, we see. Well, OK, I'll get to that scene later. So Sarah's got busted. I mean, I was looking at this episode the whole time. I'm like, well, damn, who who's going to end up dead? Who's going to what, what are they going to do with Sarah? Because, you know, George wants to 
uh, get the criers for something as soon as he can. Uh, basically, then we go over to Hannah's house. Derek and Hannah have the cutest scenes. And, you know, I put on the shelf the whole thing about me not trusting him. But, you know, the fact that she's used to being alone and doing stuff, too bad we didn't see a shirt come off. I know that sounds wrong. It's like, why didn't that man's shirt come off? No, it ain't like that. I just want to know if he has the lion tattoo. But to be completely honest, this episode was chock full of stuff. I didn't really even mind, to be honest. So basically, you know, I think Derek, uh, didn't Derek invite Hannah to stay with him if she wanted to? Interesting. So she said that she wanted a house kind of like, you know, the size of her other one. Uh, she didn't have insurance on it, you know, when Quincy came and burned it down, what crashed the car in there and that caused it to burn down. So, you know, she's learning to accept help. That's pretty good. Benny comes in and ruins it as usual. But Derek said he's going to, well, excuse me, Hannah invites Derek back for dinner. So I just like the fact that she's opening up to him. And I've already done, I did a video on this, you know, is Hannah kicking Benny out? And it, see, that's why, you know, I already went into detail on this. They pretty much said in the episode, she's just tired of him being disrespectful not signing the papers, and then the fact that Catherine Cryer has done so much for us already, give the money back, and then Benny gives this sorry-ass excuse. It's like, we've been struggling for so long, we finally got the money, you don't want to touch it. I mean, when Hannah asked, why don't you want to give it up, was he just saying that crap to cover the fact that he wants to pay them loans off first? Or was he just saying that because he meant it? But because if he did, that's just stupid because once again, you know who the money belongs to. Just give the damn money back. You're living in the house. Shit. So... He gets his box of stuff. And once again, you know, people are saying like, he only had a cardboard box. That's pitiful. Remember, he and Hannah came to the house with nothing. So that's it. You know, they just had the clothes on their back. Maybe he bought an outfit or something like that. Or I don't know. But remember, they came in there with nothing but the clothes on their backs. Keep that in mind. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Jim calls David you know, just to get intel on what's going on. Uh, pretty much, you know, talking about how he he has plans for Veronica, but then David pretty much shuts it down. Not saying that he was against Jim's plan, but it's like, oh, well, the FBI is after her. And then Jim is pretty much like, oh, well, if the feds are after her, you know, she she might be good on this city level stuff, you know, dodging, ducking, um, duck, ducking and dodging the cops and whatnot. But when it comes to the feds, <laughs> best of luck to her. And uh, pretty much... <laughs> Um, David is pretty much, you know, a trooper hanging in there. And it's like, you know, man, Jim calling up there for favors and crap. And your friend just had a heart attack. I mean, David didn't say he did, but, you know, he hung in there. Catherine comes down looking all fine and, you know, out with the old, that fragrance, uh, talking about, you know, she's going out for a meeting. And then Wyatt is just lurking around. I mean, Wyatt is like Veronica. He just pops up when you least expect it. And, you know, he literally drops the bomb that it's Broderick. And then he puts two and two together. Oh, uh, the manager at the hotel, huh? And then Wyatt, you know, is pretty much, you know, he, I, Wyatt was pretty damn good in this episode. The only thing I didn't care for was the whole, I'm going to kill you and mom. And then Jim brings up the line, what did I tell you before, son? If you say you're going to kill someone, you better do it. Remember, that was said to Wyatt way back when he had that drug and fuel rage and was about to smash Jim's head with the statue and he um, backhanded Catherine. But I don't know if that's going to lead to something, but this episode certainly had the tone of some death going on. I don't know. Uh, then Jim, you know, it's kind of funny how Jim would openly accept his son if he was gay, unlike Veronica does with Jeffrey. But, you know, pretty much, you know, it's kind of funny how Jim and Wyatt both had clapbacks for each other. I thoroughly enjoyed those scenes. Um, then not shortly, not long after that, Sarah shows up with the wire i mean not much to say about this it's just like i said in the preview when he ripped open the shirt it was for the wire like i ain't gonna lie i thought they were gonna have sex and i'm just like i wonder how that's gonna happen with wyatt in the house but yeah um he quickly opened up the shirt saw the wire she's like i'm sorry they made me do it and then kicked her out of the house that was pretty much it then why this fool is sitting at the <laughs> sitting on the steps it's kind of funny how Benny was sitting out on the steps and now you have Wyatt doing the same thing. Once again, back talking Jim, but he's too flustered to even deal with this crap right now. Um, so it's like woman, woman troubles, Jim. And pretty much, you know, he, he takes the keys, makes sure, you know, the two guys, Leo and Mac, make sure Wyatt doesn't leave. And then he just storms out of the house, most likely to go see David in the hospital. So that's pretty much, you know, where we left off before that commercial break. 
All right, and picking up where you left off, uh, Landon pretty much calls Candace over to his table over at the hotel. Uh, 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 it was a great scene, great scene. I mean, even at the very end when Candace walks off, Landon is like, huh, what the hell is wrong with me? Pushing this woman into the arms of the man I love. I'm going to be honest. I hope they drop that storyline because I, and not because of the whole, ah, oh, you, you don't want it to be gay. No, it's just like, you know, Charles is straight. Landon is pining after him like Jeffrey was with Wyatt back in season one. So I'm I'm interested to see where the Landon storyline goes. Like, I know after everything they've went through, you know, I just love how Landon cuts through Candace's bullshit. I mean, yeah, she tries to be tough and all this stuff, but, you know, her saying that she was putting on an act when it, when it comes to be caring and thoughtful. Go back to season two and season three, pretty much before Candace was going on the witch hunt for Oscar, you could really tell the scenes between her and Landon were really meaningful. Like those two were really friends. So, man, and it really, that scene between those two really um, connected well with the scene that Candace has with Charles later. But, you know, in the scene itself, pretty much it's just talking the fact that Candace is being a baby. I guess it's the best way to put it for a lack of a better phrase. You know, oh, it's like the first time you fell in love with somebody and then, oh, no, the con artist got conned. And now you just, yeah, I'm shutting myself off from everyone. Ah, uh, that kind of resonated with me, not being a con artist, con artist, but the fact that when you really care about somebody for like the first time in a while and you get close, but then it turns out it wasn't what it appeared to be because things just didn't work out. Uh, you weren't compatible, just things like that. And then after that, it's like, you know what? I put my heart out there. It got crushed. Screw it. I'm just going to build all these walls around me and just, you know, forget ever falling in love again. I can relate to that. So what really got me going was when she finally asked the question, you know, so what does this first lady thing entail? You know, what comes with it? And pretty much, you know, I love the fact, what was it when Charles was walking through the restaurant and Landon once again pointed out the uh, pointed out the um, obvious to Candace. You know good and well you were turned on by that precision. The fact that everybody looked at you when you enter a room, if you were in that position with Charles. And that's pretty in line with the Candace character. Walking into a room, wanting to be the center of attention, thinking she's the smartest one in the room once she walks in. She knows she would like it. I, And then Landon pretty much talking about politics, the way you don't take anybody's bullshit, you can read people, you're smart. Candace would fit in well. That's why she was a law student. Isn't, I wish she would have taken that exam and passed the bar. Mind you that Professor Cannon did give her that letter, which would have excelled her right to the bar exam. And if she passed it, she would have became a lawyer. But all that aside, she was still very smart because we saw, we, we have seen her apply that knowledge to good use. But she pretty much just became cold hearted as Landon said. So overall, that was a very good scene. And um, like Landon said, with time, you will definitely become a master in the political game. Uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, pretty much says go back to your room. Your floor has been cleared out. It's just you, Charles, and his uh, Secret Service and his political team. So it's just the two of you. And kind of like the um, Maggie Day and David situation, they have a joined rooms, I believe, where it's like, you know, one door leads into the other. Uh Let's see. Then we go back to the Artesian Hotel. And this was one scene I didn't like so much just because I don't know if I like Broderick just dropping the bomb like that. I thought we were at least going to get some more episodes between those two. Uh, Candace Tattoo on Facebook. She is one of my uh, most active followers to contact me a lot with stuff. We have good discussions. She gave me an idea for a theory that I wasn't going to record until after the finale because after looking at the preview and listening to her theory i'm like well based off the episode I, i'm pretty sure it's going to take place within the same night and this theory is pretty good so it'll be a good uh video to do during the hiatus she was saying that what if hannah accepts um catherine's offer to be a supervisor over at the hotel pretty much you know will be like the supervisor of house clean like she doesn't have to necessarily clean it because that'll be extra work compared to her working at the house. Remember, this was a deal established when Hannah was still working there, okay? 
pretty much he would go over there, pretty much teach the housekeeping team how to do stuff, you know, some tips and hints, and pretty much make sure everybody's doing their job. While Hannah is over there doing her work, she would eventually discover Broderick's true intentions and then would know who he really was and that he was trying to play Catherine, which would have been a great foil to Catherine knowing that Derek and Veronica have some kind of history and she would know that and Hannah doesn't like Broderick's information that Hannah knows and Catherine doesn't. It would be a great way for those two to struggle with telling information to each other because they both know they have men in their life that they care about, but this information could damage that relationship, but they don't want to see each other get hurt. I guess is the best way to put it. But to just have it all drop like that seemed pretty off to me. I mean, it does seem like it's building up to a good story based off the preview for next week, but I do feel like it was a bit too sudden. That I mean, like, yeah, I know you're... Jeremy, you sound like a hypocrite. You always talk about how some storylines are just going on way too long and stuff. What about the pacing? That is very true, but there's a difference between good pacing versus something that's slow as molasses and stuff that's just like blinking you miss it's like oh one minute we're doing we're having a good time a good affair we're you know getting it on and yeah now i want to sue you for sexual harassment oh boy let me just say this much when Catherine did that little head tilt and that smile disappeared i'm like broderick is about to die but i mean i know he was in atlanta for filming for season seven so Catherine is pretty much going to have this boy toy for quite a while he pretty much just dropped the ball about how he and Candace run the prostitution ring and, uh, you know, the bartenders and everybody, you can't fire them. So I just wanted to get this leverage over you. That way you couldn't kick Candace out of the hotel and this and that. And yeah, that's pretty much it. You know, Catherine fired him and he was like, oh, well, I don't want to do this, Catherine, but I'm going to have to sue you for sexual harassment. It's like little boy and I'm like, oh, shit. You know, you don't know who you're dealing with. You know, my that girl might be able to, you know, blackmail my husband, but that that doesn't work on me. And she pretty much proceeds to take down her shoulder straps, kick off the heels, gets in bed. I'm like, oh, man, she's getting her fill, so to speak. So pretty much it's kind of funny. Unlike Jim, who forced himself on his informants, Gia and Sarah, Catherine pretty much demanded that Broderick is going to cater to what she wants. So I'm very interested to see what's going on between those two. So that was an overall good scene. And I, I'm not hating on the scene because it didn't happen the way I wanted it to. I just felt like it was a bit weird that somebody hit the fast forward button to just steam through all this stuff. So yeah. Um, then we go back to the bar of the Iron Bone Malone bar and uh, uh, Zeke Malone. So it was not Vinny who was out of the hospital. It was actually a Malone named Zeke pretty much reporting to Mitch that Mama Rose doesn't want to talk to you. Uh, she's mad that you stopped the two guys from killing Benny in the parking lot. Um, there's nothing that could be done to stop this. But if Mitch really wants to see grandma, she, he can go down to the restaurant, but Mitch knows that is not going to go well. So he just decides to call Benny um, pretty much explain to him to keep his ass inside. He's sitting out on the stoop, refusing to go in, and Mitch calls him the word we all been thinking, stupid. And, you know, he says he's going to go pick him up. Yeah, uh, I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, then we have Candace. You know, knocking on the door. Charles gets up, thinks it's somebody at the front door. Secret Service confirms it wasn't him. He goes to the adjacent door. And we have a very good scene. Let me just say this much. I'm not really going to cover the sex scene because it seen every finale, there's some sex in there. We all know that. I mean, if you watch Nobody's Fool, that sex scene there remind me of the sex scene between her and Charles in the show. That's pretty much about it on the sex. Talking about the conversation. She apologizes for how she behaved at the restaurant. And then they have a good discussion about, you know, how Charles made it through the pain of losing his wife. But at the same time, he still had his kids. He understands Candace has gone through a lot. The fact that and this is what really gets me. The fact that instead of being bitter and closing himself off to the world. He surrounded himself with people he trusted. And while Candace is like, well, I don't have that many people. 
you have nobody to blame but yourself for that. Every ally you had, you ended up double crossing them or throwing their ass to the curb as soon as you came up. Like, remember that, what was it, Rocky, Gia, RK? It's like, oh, well, I come up, I'm out of the game. And pretty much all three of them had a hand in helping her come up. Remember when she extorted that, well, she interfered with the wire transfer of wide inheritance and everybody had a role to play in that one. So RK saved Oscar's life. Rocky pretty much got the photos from photos of uh, Oscar's computer screen and Gia was the distraction. Yet as soon as Candace got the money, oh, well, screw y'all. I'm good. I'm getting up out of here. So yeah. And not to mention she lied to Warlock and we can go on on and on and this this is not a hate on candace segment i'm just breaking it down to the fact that she says she has nobody she can trust but she broke everyone's trust by betraying them i'm just saying uh then charles pretty much reaffirms the fact that well i mean everything you've gone through the one good thing about this scene was candace finally revealing I sent a thug after my mother for some money that's not even mine. I'm like, thank God she finally said it. And Charles pretty much just says that I want to help you. Pretty much was a similar scene to Derek and Hannah. Pretty much, you know, independent black women who have carried the load themselves. But it feels weird for them to finally have help. And then Candace saying that you seem way too perfect, too good to be true. Obviously correct. I agree. But it was a very, very well done scene. They had a cute scene where they had, you know, um, you know, I don't know, vodka or something. Cheers. They, you know, sat, they talked. And eventually, you know, after everything that Charles knows about Candace, he still wants her. And, you know, I don't I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid I'm going to get hurt. I'll never break your heart and never hurt you. How do you know? I don't honestly, even though I think it's pretty jacked up if Candace immediately gets first lady status despite everything she's done in a way i don't want this to be a scam i do want her to find happiness but at the same time i feel like she does need to answer for everything she's done that includes all the characters Catherine for killing jennifer um you know veronica for all the stuff she's done you know and the list goes on so many things uh wyatt with little lizzie and then you know stabbing Vinny and all that stuff and jim from uh i mean it, it, everybody needs to pay for their crimes but at the same time it is nice to see Candace, you know, vulnerable, but at the same time, finally willing to accept. Her. I think she even you. I think she was the one or Charles that said, you know, I'm exhausted. And I'm just like, ha, there we go with that was so title. And then, you know, shut up and kiss me. Then they have sex. Very good scene. And if I'm not mistaken, we get down to the very last scene um, with um, Mitch calling Hannah, telling Hannah to let Benny in the house Next thing you know, he she goes outside and finds him there shot. And that's the end of the episode. Let me just say this. Um, okay, so I know once again these scenes are weird where scenes are supposed to be happening at the same time. So we know that Mitch called Benny saying that he was gonna pick him up from the bar. So instead of leaving immediately, did he just call Hannah really quick and say, Hey, let Benny in the house? I'm very confused by that because he calls Benny. Then we switch over to Candace and Charles at the hotel. Then we switch over to Mitch calling Hannah to let Benny in the house. So during that time frame, that's when he got shot. And another thing, at first I thought he was stabbed, but I'm thinking if he got stabbed, you know, there would have been some yelling or something like that. Or maybe, you know, somebody came up behind him, covered his mouth and then, you know, stabbed. I don't know. I'm guessing that, if he was shot, it was done with a silencer. That way, the bullet wouldn't have been heard being sh fired from the gun. Kind of like the silencer that Warlock put on his gun when he came over to the house after seeing Quincy on the floor. Because remember, that's after he learned that Candace lied to him about the money. And he fired the gun and it sounded like a little pellet being like, Pew! it didn't sound like a you know gunshot. So I'm guessing that's what happened. Because when you think about it, people are saying, man... How come Hannah didn't hear the gun go off? Well, she was in the house with the TV blasting and she was laughing loud. So that's probably why. But I'm thinking it was probably a drive by with a silencer. That's probably what happened. Not to mention in this neighborhood, I'm pretty sure if somebody heard a gunshot, you know, people would have looked out the window to see what was going on. So I'm very confused by the timing of the whole Mitch situation. Instead of leaving the bar, did he call Hannah first? I don't know. Also, 
What was Benny supposed to do if he was so stubborn and not going back in the house? He has no money. Remember, he gave the 45000 to Mitch to give back to the family. So what was he going to do? Was he just going to sit on the stoop like Stoop Kid for Hey Arnold? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But speaking of Mama Rose here, and th this is why we definitely need her to come back on the show. Now, Mama Rose, you know, I guess you if you compare the actresses, the new one is kind of like a pet bull in terms of pit bull in terms of, you know, she bites first, asks questions later. When it comes to the first Mama Rose, she seemed way more understanding and willing to listen because if Mitch went over to the restaurant to talk with Mama Rose, I feel like the conversation would have went very similar to how Jim's conversation went with her when he went over to the restaurant and talked about the Warlock case, where she was willing to hear him out, but she was still very pissed off about the situation. Now, the reason I'm kind of like weirded out by this is the fact that Mitch said that he wanted to explain his side of the story, and he's absolutely correct because, like I was saying in the live stream last night, I mean, I know that if I was in Benny's shoes, you know, if the Malones were going to go after me anyway, I would just speak my piece. My thing is this. Number one, you were, you sent two guys to kill me when I was innocent. Because remember, the two guys at the hotel bar that followed Benny into the parking lot and were shooting at him and trying to beat him up, they were after him, not for the money. They were after him because they were sent because it was thought that Benny was the one that slit Vinny's throat and left him for dead and he was innocent. Then, you know, my case would have been, look, you wrongly accused me of trying to kill one of your guys. Not to mention, when I went to the bar, I was trying to give the money back to you all and bef and I tried to explain myself and then this one dude, what was it? Not Mitch Malone, but um, Mick, Mick, uh, not he wasn't even a Malone, Mick, the guy that, came out of the back and was holding Benny at gunpoint. I was held at gunpoint. I explained the story. This dude called the cops on me. So if anything, you know, you could at least let me off the hook with the interest situation because here's your $45,000. And as a show of gratitude and apology, let me off sky free. I mean, once again, if I knew the Malones were after my ass anyway, I would just say it and just see what happens because I would think Mama Rose is a respectable woman. I mean, yeah, I know it's the mob, but they do have rules and regulations. I feel like if they wrongfully killed somebody for a crime they didn't commit, then I don't see why they wouldn't just say, okay, well, the hell with the interest. Just don't deal with us again. Hey, more power to you. I, I just wish this is why, again, this episode should have been longer, at least 90 minutes long. And they could have given us a scene between Mitch and Mama Rose. I think that would have been great because as of right now, I'm disliking Mama Rose because she just seems like, number one, an off-screen character who's just, you know, angry and not willing to listen to reason. So I wish that scene would have definitely been explored a bit more. Um, let's see here. Um, yeah, overall, you know, I think I went through the episode already. Yeah, this episode um, review is longer than I usually do, but... I wanted to really hammer home the point as to why I'm giving it like an 8.5 instead of a 10 because, well, it was a solid episode, but some things I feel would have benefited from an extended scene or, you know, just conversations that didn't really occur. I feel like we got a lot of things answered. Like, number one, Candace finally admitting it was her money. Number two, explaining why she's afraid of the first lady. Not afraid of the first lady position, but afraid of Charles. Um, then on top of that, you know, um, finally getting the intel about what was in the book. The fact that Jeffrey told what was in that book so quickly after he found it, very surprising to me. And then, you know, Veronica dropping the bomb about the whole daddy thing. I'm like, these people need to go on the Maury show. David Herring, when it comes to the case of Jeffrey Harrington, David, you are not the father. So that's going to be pretty interesting uh, in itself. But yeah, um, and I think I, I briefly talked about this in my episode trailer breakdown for Speak Through It, which was the preview we got at the end of this episode with everybody in the hospital. I'm like, oh, damn. I mean, I love the fact that we have Roderick telling Catherine about Candace and, you know, Veronica pretty much threw Candace away after she called asking for help. You know, after the bing, bang, boom, Jim already hates her. David doesn't care for her, especially after finding out 
uh, what happened with Erica, then Jeffrey knows that Candace was in league with it anyway. So we've always talked about, we want to see Candace as first lady just to get the reactions of all the characters. Now, if they see her in the hospital, my God, my God, it is going to be one hell of a show. Can you imagine them trying to come up to Candace saying like, uh, number nine, whore, little girl, slut, all that stuff. And then Charles shuts it down. That is going to be fantastic. So overall, guys, it was a pretty solid episode. Some things I wish were either changed. Some things I wish were added to the episode. But it was good for what it was. I'm not saying that to say it was an average episode. It really was thrilling. The ang And just to talk about, you know, I don't really talk about it this much. I do talk about how the camera work is all is good. But I don't really talk about, oh, the the outside shots of the houses and locations. They're really well done. They really keep me engaged. Not to mention, I feel like they're kind of like the bookmarks of the episode. So when you're rewatching, it's like, let me stop at the county jail and then I'll come back later. That kind of thing. But, um... You know, I, I just wanted to say before I ended this video, thank you all so much. It has been a great year for the haves and the have nots. Yes, it, it ha it's had its ups, it's had its downs, good episodes, bad episodes. You, If you've been on the channel long enough, you know, how I, you know how, what I mean by that. But, I mean, we celebrated last month me being full-time YouTuber for over a year. I couldn't have do done it without you all. We hit so many milestones recently we hit over 50,000 subscribers so we're almost we're at the halfway point of where i want to be which is 100,000 so if you haven't done so already i highly recommend subscribing to the channel just because the show is on break that does not mean i'm not producing new content once we get new news i'll be putting that out there also if you haven't already be sure to check the links in the description below i said this in the video intro but i have links to my have and have not Instagram, Twitter, Facebook page, Facebook group. Check out my eBay. I got a bunch of stuff on there. Video games, action figures, uh, trading cards, all that good stuff. Um, I'm really going to be trying to get a podcast up and running within the next two weeks here. There are, but there are a lot of TV shows I don't really talk about on YouTube channel because they're not have and have not related. I might vaguely talk maybe Dragon Ball, Pokemon, Flash, Black Lightning, but I might actually start doing that on a podcast. I do possibly have a couple of interviews lined up with a one or two of the have and have not cast members. I'm still working out the details. I can't tell you who it is yet. I, I'm still working out the details with them. But once we get the podcast and all started, I'm really trying to get this channel up and going in terms of 50,000 is a lot. It is. But I mean, I'm trying to really push it to the next level. So once again, I could not have done it without you. Expect multiple videos over the hiatus. We're talking a season five overview, top moments, top worst moments, favorite episodes, just any and everything. Just because the show is off doesn't mean the channel is off because, well, this is what I do for a living. So once again, folks, what a finale. We had 33 episodes in 2018. Wow. So thanks so much for tuning in. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. What were your thoughts on Exhausted? What were some of your favorite parts? What was the most surprising parts? Uh, do you agree with the score of an 8.5 out of 10? What would you rank it as? And uh, yeah, try to share this video around as much as you can because, well, trying to get, you know, as many people out there to come to the channel. And also November 27th, I believe it's called Back to the Beginning. We're going to be watching from episode one, pretty much every episode of the haves and have nots. This is one of those things where Tyler Perry needs to host an event to get fans together. I would love to go. I mean, it's one thing to meet the cast members and Tyler Perry himself, which would be fantastic. But I'm more interested in meeting other fans, to be honest. You, you know, especially um, the fact that, sorry, just random telemarketer call. The fact that we talk about it so much on this channel and on my social media, I would love to meet a lot of you all in person because you all treat me like I'm a darn star of the show. It's almost like, you know, I'm kind of like an encyclopedia, but I still learn a lot from talking with you. But um, not to downplay the um, the marathon, I even tweeted Tyler Perry, like, yo, the, the binge-a-thon is awesome, but put this stuff on DVD, man. That's what I'm saying. 
because when I saw that commercial, and I think I think that I'm going to do a tr- um a video on the commercial itself, and he's like, uh, "You've been asking for it for a while." I'm like, "Yes," because they show like season one scenes. I'm like, "Is it DVD? Is it Blu-ray?" And I'm like, "Yo, man, I want I want I want a home video." And not look again, not to downplay the marathon because I do appreciate it. Guys, the show has been on Hulu for like what a month or two months now, so you can have a marathon anytime you want. Personally, I've rewatched the first three seasons on Hulu already, so I might tune in, but not that much, you know. So whatever. But thanks so much for tuning in, guys. Um, I will be doing some live streams later, so keep your eyes on my channel for that, and I'll talk to you all soon.